The Ben Heck Show is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com. Hello and welcome back to the Ben Heck Show. It's time to get back to the super glue gun builds. That's right. So in previous episodes, we've worked on the triac to control the hot end, extruding glue through the hot end, and also finding the best DC gear motor and drive gear to push the glue through the hot end. What are we going to do next, Ben? Today's episode, we're going to make another test rig using a slightly faster DC gear motor, just to make sure it still works, because mm -hmm. that one we used last time was 3 RPM. I also want to get started programming the microcontroller. I want to use an AT Tiny that will drive everything in the glue gun. Well, I think it's time to get started. Amazing hacks. Should we take it for a spin? Inspired Designs. Imhotep's Priests. Regrettable Acting. No one seems to get it. Each week, Element 14's The Ben Heck Show brings you innovative projects using electronics, engineering, and more. This is the same form factor motor as we tried before, except for it's 50 RPM instead of three, which is a lot better. Um, the mounting is different. Instead of the tabs on the side, it has um, three M3 screw mounts. So I measured the first one here, measured the inner diameter, got uh, 2.57. Then I measured from edge to inner diameter, and I got uh, like 4.7. So I'm kind of thinking it's probably meant to be six millimeters in, because it's so close. And um, there's two more holes. This hole was clearly aligned to the center point of the shaft. These two aren't, but since there's three, they're going to be 120 degrees apart because it's 360 divided by three. So what I can do on my drawing here, see, I'm gonna erase this one. I'm gonna do an offset. I'm gonna come in six, negative six millimeters like that. I'm gonna draw the first one on the six millimeter point, two point, well, I'll just make it three millimeters because it's intended for a three millimeter screw. Okay, now what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna draw another one up here. Again, three millimeters. Now I'm gonna see if I can dimension this to an angle. I'm not sure if I've actually done that before on here. Let's see if it's possible. There's a cheap way I could do it. I could just draw a line here. So straight up is 90 degrees, so I could just come over 120. You just type in 120, keep the length the same, and boom, that would be my point. Same thing down here. So we got like 180, come down to 120. Yeah, that's probably a way to sketch dimension and angle. I am not exactly sure how that's done, so I'm just gonna rough it like this. All right. What I'm gonna do next is I'm gonna actually export this as a DXF so I can cut a paper pattern on the laser, make sure the holes are correct, the laser's fast. Once I know the holes are correct, then I can slowly print it. Wow, this paper pattern is way off, look at that. The shaft isn't actual, well, it's probably level. Yeah, you'd think these two screws would be the same distance in from the outer edge, but for some reason, they're not. Okay, um, also the shaft appears to be a little bit to the left. So yeah, good thing I ran a paper pattern before I spent the time with a 3D print. So each one of these screw mounts is a different distance from the center of the motor. The three of them are about 2.5 degrees rotated this way from the shaft. And these two are at 120 degrees, but this one's more like 122 degrees. I could probably also bring this shaft in just a little bit, just a little bit like, oh gosh, like 0.2 millimeters. Oh, I've done all these paper patterns, but now I know when I print the test, it will be correct. So I use cheap, fast paper instead of slow, expensive plastic. All right, here's the latest revision. It's kind of loose. Let's measure the distance because you don't really know until you build it. This is 6.25 millimeters. This one is 6.75. Okay, so we need to make this a little closer. So it's parametric, so I can just go in and change 23 millimeters shaft to shaft spacing to 22.5. And since I started this as the base, it's going to move this one in a little bit. So I'm gonna print another one. Once I have that dialed in, then we're gonna take the glue stick, get its center point, and use that to make our guide shaft. And then we can get close enough to do a test with the hot end again. So this was a three, 
RPM motor. This is 50. So obviously it's a lot faster, which will give us a lot more control over the speed. However, uh, more speed means less torque. So hopefully it still has enough power to uh, push the glue through the hot end. Time to assemble this again. Seems to work. Now I'm going to make the next revision of the 3D print so we can push it through the hot end. I made a new board for AT Tiny development and I had a larger socket in here for the AT Tiny 20, but also I'm working on a sub socket for the AT Tiny 4, the really small one. That way I have a couple different options as to what I can use for the super glue gun. And I think I'm gonna use the AT Tiny 20 just because I need, you know, I don't know, six IO, not an insignificant amount. I just thought it'd be cool to have a way to program these little chips as well, especially since um, these use the TPI interface, not the normal SPI, which is a two wire interface. So it's probably closer to I squared C than SPI. Oh yeah, I'll get this uh, wired up and then we can work on some code. I decided to take a break from motors for a little bit to work on microcontroller stuff for the super glue gun. We bought a bunch of AT Tinies to evaluate. We have these really small AT Tiny 10s, which you can probably barely even see. They're six pin. It's probably not gonna be enough IO for us to use. So I have a rig right here with the AT Tiny 20, which has uh, 12 IO or 11 if you're using the reset pin. So that should be pretty good. It also has quite a few ADCs. It looks like it has eight ADCs, which should be more than we need. That should allow us to use PWM control, ADC, touch control, all sorts of stuff. All right, so I'm using AVR Studio. Oh wait, no, they call it Atmel Studio now because if you have an ARM chip made by Atmel, it's not an AVR. But the AT Tiny 20 is an AVR. All right, so we're doing define frequency of CPU, eight megahertz, include the standard libraries. I have a few uh, functions here, set speed. This will set the speed of the PWM output. ADC setup, we set the uh, prescaler to the clock divided by 16 and enable it. Then we write justify it. So it's, it's gonna be a 10-bit value, but there's an 8-bit CPU. So we have to read the 10-bit value in two successive reads. Now also bit a function ADC read. So the ADC is multiplex, which means you can actually only look at one at a time. So we tell it, okay, we wanna look at a certain one. In this case, we're using ADC five. Tell it to start the conversion then we have to wait for it to do the conversion. If you've ever used ADC libraries with the Arduino, you probably know they're kind of slow and that's why, because it triggers a conversion, then you have to wait to get the result. Once it's done, you're gonna return the value. Remember how I said there were two bytes? Since it's a 10-bit value, it doesn't fit in an 8-bit register. So we're going to return the low byte, ADC low, and combine it, or or it, with ADC high, bit shifted to the left, and that will make a 16-bit value, yay. Okay, so here's our main function that's going to set everything up and then loop. We're gonna set the clock to no division. Uh, AVRs usually come with a uh, clock divided by eight as the default. On the larger ones, you can go into the tool menu here, and oh look, I'm gonna look at my fuses, right? But this one only has a few options. The AT Mega 32.8, has quite a few more options in this, including clock divider options. We don't have that here. So you do it in the code. So we set CCP equals D8 in hex. That says, hey, we want to write to a protected register. Now we have four instructions with which to do it. So we're going to change the prescaler to zero, which basically means divide by one or you know just don't divide it. The default is divide by eight, which means your eight megahertz internal oscillator is divided by eight. So your program runs at one megahertz. All right, we're going to set the PWM pin to be an output by using the DDRB register here. So we're orient in a one. This is kind of confusing for me because it's actually the inverse of microchip products. Although I guess it's the same company now because in PIC 32s or PICs, a one is an input and a zero is an output. But in this, a one is an output and a zero is an input. All right, so we're gonna set up a timer and the timer is going to be used to actually drive the PWM. Okay, once the timer hits the computer, 
compare value, it's going to trigger PB1. That's why we have to make that pin an output. So, okay, phase correct, PWM mode, clock source equals clock divided by eight, start PWM, ADC setup. Okay, well, we saw that earlier where we started the ADC. All right, set speed, ADC read five. So we're going to call that command and then set the speed, which basically it's a function within a function. So we're gonna call the set speed function and we're gonna give it the result of the ADC read function anded with FF. The reason we're doing that is because earlier I mentioned there's two bytes that are combined into a 16 byte value for the ADC. And just for this demo, our uh, our timer, our PWM timer only goes from zero to 255. So I don't wanna put extraneous bits into it. So I'm anding the 10 bit value with an eight bit value. So we only have an eight bit value. And then we just delay and uh, do it all over again. All right, so let's send this to the scope. And now we have, we have a potentiometer controlling a PWM output signal. So for motor control, the shorter pulses would be slower and the fuller the pulse is like this would be faster. Awesome. Uh, yeah, the reason I wanted to have the full 10-bit ADC is I want to have, I want the temperature control to be fairly accurate as before in our previous episode where we were using the TRIAC. We were looking for a range of about 10 degrees. So if you're, you know, five below or five above, it either turns it on or turns it off. So yeah, you know, it takes a little longer to get that value, but I don't care. So yeah, um, I'm going to do all the code in Atmel Studio so we can develop it really low level and then we can have a file, a hex file that's easy to program. And then we can make this device. You know, I was looking at motor drivers and I just wasn't feeling the love tonight. I think what I might explore doing is making my own H-bridge on the PCB because that seems nice and cheap. I mean, we have a microcontroller, so we don't need all that other fancy stuff that would be in a motor controller. So I think I'll find some MOSFETs like N-channel, NP-channel, so we can make a full H-bridge and then just see what that would cost, you know, versus a dedicated integrated circuit. Yeah, so I need some transistors and then some MOSFET transistors. I guess MOSFET transistor is actually kind of redundant because it's metal oxide semiconductor field effect transistor transistor. Of course, if I go on my pixel, it's like type an SMS message. That would be short message service message. I could type that in the Sahara Desert with Ra, the sun god. Uh, yeah, so anyway, what I'm gonna try to find are some dual uh, MOSFETs. I was looking at some of these here. Oh, dual MOSFET N and P. Uh, let's see, yeah, uh, there's not that many of those, so. Oh wait, oh, they're labeled in a different ways. N and P channel, okay. Let's see what we got here. Let's try to find the cheapest ones we can. What I think I'm gonna do now is find some power MOSFETs so I can make my own H bridge and then I'll wire that up manually so I know exactly what's going on. Then I can low level control it with a microcontroller. It would be a lot easier if the motor only had to go forward, but I guess we want it to go backwards as well. So we're gonna need an H bridge so we can have both directions. We also have to figure out the uh, auto stand, the thing that kicks out. We could possibly use a servo, like use another timer on the tiny to go and like have some PWM running at 50 Hertz. Yeah, but for now, I'm just gonna figure out the cheapest way to possibly drive a motor and then order some parts to make that possible. Well, that's all the time we have for today, but it feels like we made some good progress with the super glue gun. Yeah, you got glue to extrude, hooray! Yeah, I found a small motor that had a five millimeter shaft, allowing us to easily hook up a 3D printer gear and it worked. Oh, and we got a bunch of comments about why don't you just take a five millimeter gear and drill it out into a six millimeter gear because you were having trouble finding a motor with a... Because that would take too long. Yep. We gotta be able to get parts that we off can the just shelf, buy. Off the shelf, boom, that's what we have to do. Yep. So. We also worked on the microcontroller. We got that to do PWM and ADC control. So I think the AT Tiny 20 will be perfectly suitable and it's pretty cheap. It's like 70 cents. Uh, we also started working on the motor driver. We didn't have as much luck with that, but what we're gonna try in a future episode is taking some MOSFETs and manually creating our own H bridge. That way we can make the motor controller do exactly what we need it to. Yeah, so Felix is working on that. So if you have any comments or questions, let us 
know in the Element 14 community. Remember to post those on the Super Glue Gun subspace on element14.com forward slash TBHS. You can also go there to read about other upcoming episodes, builds, and special events. Well, like glue, stick around. We'll see you next time. Now I'm sloth slow.